Looks like we got into a series of uh, YouTubes that are debunking the evidence that evolutionists claim supports their point of view. Now we're looking at the hand tools of these supposed primitive human beings, like the Aculean hand axe. Aculean, yeah, sounds like right. However, it was truly used worldwide. This is in BibleStudyManuals.net, K96.htm. Look at hand tools, the Aculean hand axe, however, was truly used worldwide. It is found from northern Europe to southern Africa and from the Mediterranean to India and Indonesia. In shape, it resembles a giant almond pointed at one end, rounded on the other. The pointed end is thinner, the rounded end is thicker, but overall it is rather flat like an almond. Experts led to conclude that the hand axe was actually a flying projectile weapon thrown discus style and used in the hunting of large game. So, Eileen O'Brien, hand axes are found in great numbers in places that used to be streams, rivers, lakes. It would be logical for bands of ancient humans to attack animals when they came to water. Axes that were overthrown and landed in the water usually would not be recovered which could explain why we find them in the, those places today. Also significant is that the Aculean hand axe first appears in the archaeological record at about the same as evidences of large animal kills, hippopotamus, elephant, dinotherium, an extinct elephant-like animal with large tusks in the lower jaw. Now we have Homo habilis, either completely animal or completely human. Have these little terms that aren't specifically defined, but we have general idea. Nutcracker man is a primate. Ubenau says in Bones of Contention, one day in 1959, at a certain spot in Old Dubai Gorge, Tanzania, Mary Leakey saw sticking teeth sticking out of the ground. Excavation realized revealed a large cranium having some resemblance to the South African robust. Australia Pithecines. The stone tools found in association with the fossil led Lewis Leakey to believe that this le individual was a toolmaker. And to Lewis, toolmaking meant just one thing man, fully man. Believing that they had found the first toolmaker, Lewis named the fossil Zinjanthropus, East Africa man. The ridiculously large molars indicated that the individual probably lived on nuts and berries, and so it became affectionately known as Nutcracker Man. Some of us suspect that Lewis knew all along that Zinja was just a variant of a robust Australia pithecine. They all had to be unique because they were looking for the big bucks. But the financial support, ah, there it goes, Lewis desperately needed to continue his work does not come from the discovery of fossil primates. It comes from finding human ancestors. The long financial association the League has had with the National Geographic Society began at this time. Telling of the discovery of Zinja in National Geographic, Lewis began to report the teeth were projecting from the rock face, smooth and shining and quite obviously human. Lewis B. Leakey, Finding the World's Earliest Man, National Geographic. You trust it now? Included in the article is an artist's painting of what Zinj might have looked like. Wow. It was quite a piece of work. Whereas our eyes are about midway between our chin and the top of our head, there was hardly any head at all showing above Zinj's eyes. He had virtually no brain. But the skill of the National Geographic artist was such that the portrait was almost believable. I've been here a while, a little uncomfortable. Completely human. Habilius discoveries. It was not long before the Leakeys began to find the remains of another type of fossil individual after they had discovered Nutcracker Man. This type was a far better candidate for human ancestry. Lewis began to realize that Zinn's Nutcracker Man really was just a super robust Australia pithecine, i.e. non-human, and it is now known as Australia Pithecus Boise. Well, they changed the name, right? 
Shame on National Geographic, drawing a picture and painting over him what he looked like as a human. What Lewis claimed was obviously human turned out to be obviously non-human. In Halloween, you go around, pretend you're an ape. But when it's a fossil, it's either an ape or a man. On the other hand, those newer fossils consisted of cranial fragments, hand bones, and foot bones. The foot bones seemed to indicate bipedality. The, hum the hand bones seemed to indicate manual dexterity. The associated stone tools formerly attributed to Zinj was now described to have those newer, to these new individuals. New, different item, same story. 1964, Lewis Leakey, Philip Tobias, University of Whitwaterstrand, and John Napier, University of London, announced in Nature magazine a new human ancestor, Homo habilis, a new species of the genus Homo from Olduvai Gorge. So he yeah, hadn't written for a while, so now he wants a few more bucks. Since some of these fossils were found in bed one, they were also dated at 1.8 million years ago. From the start, these, those fossils were the subject of intense controversy. Some felt that they were just a mixture of Australopithecine and Homo erectus fossils. Remember the jar with a hundred individuals in it? And hence, they did not constitute a new taxon. Even those who were sympathetic to the new category recognized that the fossils were a mixture of juvenile and adult material, and juvenile material is difficult to evaluate. Wow, they, they, didn't, have any, they didn't have enough jars? However, a philosophical problem was also at the center of the controversy. At that time, the accepted scenario for human evolution went from Australopithecus africanus, including Tong, to Homo erectus, and then on to Homo sapiens. Many evolutionists felt that there was not room for between africanus and erectus for another species, nor was there a need for one. Wow. But Lewis was marching to the tune of a different drummer. The big bucks. Lewis believed in all Homo. Lewis did not believe that humans had evolved from the Australopithecines, and at least not from the ones that he had been discovered he had been discovered by him thus far. He wanted credit. He wants to take away from somebody else. The fighting for fame, not truth. He believed that the transition from primates to humans took place much further back in time. In Lewis's evolutionary scheme, there was not any only room for a new taxon. There was a desperate need for one. He was empty while it was empty. In fact, Lewis felt that he had discovered the true ancestor of modern humans. Wow. People are ready to get on board with anybody. Lewis Leakey was at least consistent. He recognized that for evolution to go from Africanus to Erectus to Sapiens presented a problem. The cranium, cranium of Africanus, although very small, is thin, high-domed, and gracile. The Erectus cranium is thick, low-domed, and robust. The Sapiens cranium is thin, high-domed, and gracile. Thus, to go from Africanus to Erectus represents a reversal in morphology and a re reversal of an is an evolutionary no-no. Can't go backwards. It was for the reason, this reason, that Lewis believed that neither Homo erectus nor the Neanderthals were in the mainstream of human evolution. Yell extinct and start something new so you can make some more money. Both these robust groups, he felt, were evolutionary cul-de-sacs that led to extinction. There you go. The Homo habilis cranium, on the other hand, was thin, high dome to gracile. By going from hib habilis directly to sapiens, Lewis avoided the reversal problem. Although most evolutionists have accepted habilis into the hominid family, they also have retained erectus. Hence, they still have a, a reversal problem in going from habilis to erectus to sapiens. However, the turning point towards acceptance of Homo habilis into the hominid family by evolutionists came in 1972 when Lewis's son Richard, working at a site on Lake Rudolph, now Lake Turkana in northern Kenya, found the famous fossil skull and leg bones known as KNMRER 1470 and 1481. Wow, I don't know. Shocking about the fossil was its large cranial size, about 800 cc's, and its very modern morphology, which includes high doming 
and thin cranial walls. The skull was so different from what evolution theory would predict that Richard Leakey said, either we toss out this skull or we toss it out our, out our theories of early man. It simply puts no previous models, fits no previous models of human beginnings. They got their theory according to their wallet. And it was in National Geographic. In reporting the new fossil discovery, Science News wrote, Leakey further describes the whole shape of the brain case as remarkably reminiscent of modern man, lacking the heavy and protruding eyebrow ridges and thick bone characteristics of Homo erectus. I've seen some from worldwide wrestling wrestlers that have uh, heads like that. They're, they're wrestling today, they're alive. Science News 102, in his nature report, and on the football field, Richard Leakey stated the 1470 cranium is quite distinct from H. erectors. And he wrote another, he's very prolific in his writing, evidence for an advanced Pleo Pleistocene hominid from East Rudolph, Kenya. Okay, in fact, comparisons show that Skull 1470 is more modern than any of the Homo erectus fossils, even the cow swamp material, which is only about 10,000 years old. He's willing to outdo anybody. On the other hand, Skull, well, maybe you bought a new house or something. On the other hand, Skull 1470, obviously it's not an australopithecine, although some, such as Alan Walker, have suggested that it might be. Its cranial capacity is far beyond even the largest known australopithecine. What is disconcerting to evolutionists is that 1470's cranial capacity is well within the range of modern humans. That 1470 is not a unique specimen is shown by the fact that other fossils of the same age have been found with close affinities to 1470. 1590 consists of dental and cranial fragments. Although this cranium is from an immature individual is as large as 1470, hence in adulthood it would have been even larger. In 1802, Amanda Bull may also belong to this group. Skull number 1802. Not only does skull 1470 qualify for human status based on cranial size, shape, and cranial wall thickness, there's also evidence on the inside of the skull, or bronchus area, that part of the brain that controls the muscles for producing articulate speech in humans. The two foremost, oops, the two foremost experts on human brain evolution. Dean Falk of the State University of New York at Albany and Ralph Holloway of Columbia University usually disagree. But even they agree that Broca's area is present in a skull from East Turkana known as 1470. So Philip Tobias, a renowned brain expert from South Africa, concurs. So if having the brains to speak is the issue, apparently Homo has had its from the beginning. Well, itchy nose. So, Arthro Quest. There is no question that bias intervened in the reconstruction of Skull 1470. The face was given the larger slant off of the perpendicular to make it look more like a transitional form between primates and humans, especially when at the time of its reconstruction it was thought to be 2.9 million years old. <laughs> Bias is also obvious in the way famed artist Jay Matherns put flesh on the bones of Skull 1470 as seen in the June 1973 issue of National Geographic. Maternus shows possessor of Skull 1470 to be a younger black woman who looks very human except that she has an ape-like nose. Human noses are a composed of cartilage which normally does not fossilize and the nose is missing on 1470. So what do they put it on for? It is obvious that the purpose is giving the reconstructed Skull 1470 woman an ape-like nose was to make her look as primitive as possible. The decision of what kind of nose to give her was an entirely subjective one made by Maternus or his advisors. What if they used Maybelline makeup, too? With a human nose, none would question the full humanity of that woman in National Geographic. More on this next time.